All right, it is time for us to get started with this next lecture. If you will, please come on to your seats. I want to mention a couple of books real quick while you're coming back to your seats. Uh, I mentioned this one yesterday uh, following Mike Willis's lecture, but I want to mention it again. This is a brand new book, My Living Sacrifice uh, by Mike, that is uh, covering Romans 12 and 13. And we have those in the foyer. Please take a look. Again, that's brand new. One that we've had for a number of years that... Uh, uh, it's easy to forget about if you don't watch out, is Jesus the Bread of Life. And this is a four-quarter study on the life of Jesus. Uh, and, you know, this is obviously going to be top of mind following these lectures. Uh, if you wanted to go back to your home congregation and work through a four-quarter study uh, and, and you want something that's not quite as technical as the lectures, if you will, but just a, an overview, complete study, this would be uh, something I would highly recommend. These are also in the foyer. You could take a closer look at them uh, if you get a chance as well. Uh, Mark will come now and introduce our next speaker. Brother Kevin Maxey and his wife Jennifer, dear friends of many of us, they have five children and they have labored since 2009 at the Port Royal Congregation uh, near Spring Hill, Tennessee. And of course, Kevin has preached in other places as well, Oregon, Florida, Texas, Arkansas, Germany, and made a number of trips overseas to preach the gospel in foreign lands. Uh, he has considerable accomplishments in the academic realm and was recently granted his doctorate, doctorate at, uh, at Lipscomb University. And yet he hasn't lost the common touch and he certainly has maintained his faith and conviction and dedication to God through all of that. He and his wife are gifted writers and so we have benefited from uh, the good articles he submitted uh, to Truth Magazine and the previous participation he's had in different ways and her writing also is is uh, appreciated by our sisters uh, in, in Bible classes and ladies classes. Uh, Kevin has served as an advisor and now as a, as a full board member to Truth Publications and he missed the last meeting and so we just assigned him all the hard things that have to be done and the one task he doesn't know about but I would love to hand off to him is there are 11,000 individual web pages on truthmagazine.com scanned in and some of them have errors and Kevin, you can handle that, can't you? <laughs> no, we are, we are delighted to have his involvement in this organization as we seek to produce good Bible literature. And he brings a lot to both the podium this morning but, and, and the subject at hand in particular, uh, but our collective efforts as well. As well. You know, this article and, and the lecture that you're about to hear is one that is rich on a number of levels. First of all, uh, it, it is rooted in a respect for Scripture and accurately communicating God's will on this particular subject of, I believe, Jesus and the impact he has upon us today. But, but it is also connected with the, the notion of, of how that impacts us as we go through the stages of life that can sometimes be traumatic. You know, in editing a manuscript, that's often a, a sort of a technical and tedious process of making sure grammatically things are correct and stylistically things meet our style guide. This manuscript moved me to tears because of the experience that he describes and that you will note as he communicates to you this morning. And so, Kevin, come speak to us. When my oldest daughter was little, she loved swinging in the backyard. And one of my favorite memories is pushing her on the swing and hearing her shout with every ounce of enthusiasm that her little three-year-old body could muster. She would shout, push me high up in the sky, Da. I believe that's a great description of what our role is as parents to push our children skyward, to inspire them to dream, to equip them for those dreams, and to, to support them as they chase those dreams, to pick them up when they fall, and to help them fly Godward and heavenward. Jessica was our oldest child, and so she didn't have older siblings to play with, and so some of her younger years were lonely. And I remember one afternoon hearing her shout in the backyard, 
shouting, and so I ran to the back to see what she was shouting about. And she was looking up, she was on her swing, and she was looking up in the sky saying, Jesus, come play with me. And so in her little three-year-old mind, we had told her that Jesus was coming in the clouds. And so that's where she thought Jesus was. And she wanted Jesus to be her friend. I love this childlike faith. And it's a childlike faith that we all should have. And I believe it's a great description of our desire for the divine presence and our desire to be in Christ's presence. Is this just a cute little children's story? Or is it something that tells us that we crave a relationship with Jesus that we are missing. My topic this morning is, I believe that Jesus is with believers always. And so I want to ask you four questions. First question is, do you believe in Jesus? Well, that obviously is an easy question to answer at the end of an intensive week-long lectureship dealing with apologetics about the life of Jesus. And so you would say yes. But I want to get a little bit more direct. Do you believe that Jesus is with believers? And as you look at this theological question, you would say, well, yes, I believe Jesus is with believers. I want to get more personal. Do you believe that Jesus is with you? This past week, the Alpha and the Omega, the King of Kings, was He with you? Was He with you, the great I Am, the risen Savior of the world? And if He is with you, how is He with you? And how is that presence manifested? And let me get a little bit more specific. Do you believe that Jesus is with you always? Be honest. Think back to harsh times of failure and bitter disappointment. Was Jesus, our risen Lord, with you then? What about times of vulnerable weakness or when you're facing what seems to be impossible temptation? Was Jesus, the eternal potentate, with you then? And what about times of crushing trial and exhausting hardship? Is Jesus with you always? A time of crushing trial hit our family on January 11th of this past year. It was a Tuesday afternoon, 2.29. We received a phone call from an off-duty paramedic named Kenny, who was driving just a few cars behind my daughter. And he witnessed her get struck from behind on I-75 in Florida, Tampa, by a car that was going 100 miles an hour. And she flipped, she was in the passenger side, she flipped eight times, he said, over three lanes of traffic and landed over in the median. So Kenny had just pulled my daughter out of the car, she was hanging upside down, and he put her on the phone, and I heard her say, my foot hurts, there's a lot of blood, Matt, her boyfriend, was still in the car said, they can't get him out. I can hear Matt screaming, and I could hear Matt screaming on the other end of the phone. She said, I smell gas. I don't know what we're going to do. Feeling very inadequate, Jennifer and I tried to reassure her to stay strong, that we love her, and that we're on our way. And so the only problem was, is we were 718 miles away in Tennessee. So we paced around the house, we prayed, we panicked, we threw some clothes in a bag, we got in the car, and we drove through the night. The longest night of our life, because we didn't know if our daughter or Matt were going to live or die. During moments like that, during crushing trials In catastrophe, Satan tempts us to question the presence of God. And I'm confident that we go around the room, and every one of you 
could share similar stories of tragedy, hardship, suffering. And we asked the question, where is God during those times? Atheist Sam Harris claims that events like this prove that God doesn't exist. And he very brashly states, either God can do nothing to stop catastrophes like this, or he doesn't care to, or he doesn't exist. God is either impotent, evil, or imaginary. Even his denial of God is an admission that man has been searching for divine presence from the beginning of time. Whether you admit it or not, man, humanity, has been running to or running away from God ever since the beginning. And Adam, in the beginning, was hiding from God. Pre-flood humanity ignored God. Angry Jonah ran away from God. Even King David in Psalm 13, as he pours out his, his heart to God, said, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? We learn that catastrophic presence does not negate divine presence. And you see that in Psalm 23, where we know that God is our shepherd, Jesus is our shepherd who is present with us in the still waters and by the green pastures, but also David writes about his confidence that God is present, that we will fear no evil because he is with us in the presence of our enemies, and even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. God is present even in times of catastrophe. And so my family's experience, even in the terror of that car accident, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, I want to affirm to you that we learned that God is present. And the main text that we're going to look at for our study is the Great Commission passage. So if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 28... Matthew chapter 28 and verses 16 through 20, we find three reasons why I believe that Jesus is with believers always. Because this text tells us it's a promised presence, it's a proven presence, and it's an empowering presence. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, and let's revisit this familiar passage, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, To observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So this text tells us these three points. That Jesus has promised his presence. His presence is proven. And his presence is empowering. As we look at this Great Commission passage, we rightly so describe this as the Great great Commission However, do you understand that there is a great promise that follows the Great Commission? That the Bible gives us this instruction that Jesus is sending out his apostles to go out and to carry on this mission. And he doesn't send them alone. He gives them this great promise and he tells them that he would be with them. I am with you always. Notice that he says, and he draws attention to this promise by using the word behold. We don't use that word often. But if Lance were to run in here and make a statement and say, look here, we would give him our full attention. This is an exclamatory statement that Jesus is wanting to give us, get our attention. Five times, in fact, in Matthew 28, we see the word behold or look. And it's made to get our attention in chapter 28 and verse 2. Behold, there was an earthquake. Chapter 28 and verse 7, Jesus is risen. Behold. Verse 9, behold, he is risen. Verse 11, behold, the guards report that Jesus is risen. And behold, I am with you always. We listen to other promises of Jesus, but are you listening to this promise? 
that he says that he will be with us. He's demanding our attention. How often have you grabbed your child? Maybe they're in danger and they're scared and they're panicked and you say, look at me. I want your attention. You will be okay. And this is what Jesus is doing. This is a promise that is noteworthy. It is a promise that is mission defining. And it is a promise that is action empowering. Jesus is saying, focus on me. And I believe he's saying, focus on me to three different groups of people for three different reasons. Could you imagine if you were the apostles? They've just seen their savior be beaten and slaughtered and crucified. And finally, they now see that he's risen. And then suddenly, their risen Lord is leaving them. And so he's telling them, though my bodily presence is about to depart, my divine presence would remain. The apostles urgently needed to understand that there was a difference between the bodily manifestation of Jesus' presence and his spiritual manifestation, his divine presence. They needed to hear as they were shook to the core about all the things that had happened that they had a job to do and Jesus was saying that he was going to be with them. The apostles need to hear this message. The original readers in the, the Gospel of Matthew needed to hear this message. So remember that Matthew is compiling all of these accounts. He's inspired, and he's writing it what appears to be to a Jewish audience who could have been filled with either Christian, Jewish Christians that were saying, well, it's been some time now since Jesus has, has returned. Where is he? They needed to hear about his presence, or maybe it was Jews that needed to be converted to Christ, and they're saying, well, he's gone. They need to hear that Jesus is present. And that's a theme that runs through the Gospel of Matthew. We read in Matthew 1, in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of Matthew, there is this theme that God or Christ is present. Matthew 1.23, Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us. Right at the beginning of the book is an emphasis on the presence of Jesus. In the middle of the book, in Matthew 18 and verse 20, Matthew promises that Jesus would be present whether two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of them. I will be present. And then here at the conclusion in Matthew 28, 20, the last words that Matthew records that he wants his listeners to hear, the last words of his gospel is, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The apostles needed to hear it. The audience in the first century that read the book of Matthew needed to hear it. And we today, as modern disciples, need to hear it. And if you were to ask me this question, do you believe that Jesus is with believers always? If you had asked me this question about a year ago, I probably would have struggled with how to answer that question. And just to be honest, I think about my relationship with the Father, and I feel like I talk to the Father in prayer, uh, all the time, and, I, and I, I can feel his presence. I know that the Bible talks about how Jesus ascended and he went to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit dwells in us and we understand that role. We also understand that God has angels who are ministering spirits sent to minister to those who inherit salvation. So we can understand. I can understand about the Holy Spirit and I understand about angels and I understand about the Father. But when I think about Jesus, often personally in my life, I have sort of relegated Jesus that he's, he's gone and he's at the throne. And I don't really think about what he does today and how he interacts and that he is really present with me. When I talk to Jessica... As I was completing this lecture after the accident, I was asking her about this and talking about some of the things I've been studying. And I said, well, which member of the Godhead do you most comfortably feel that you relate to? And she said it was Jesus because he came in the flesh to be like us and to walk in our steps. And that makes sense. And, and perhaps she's kept her childlike faith. And I have missed that in the sense of not seeing and hearing this promise that God tells us that Jesus, that Jesus himself promises that he would be with us. And when we look at this and you say, well, I don't, how, how is he with us? In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, we need to have the faith that Paul had. In Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. 
the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I, like Paul, believe Christ lives in me. Do you believe? Paul knew that Jesus was with him. Paul said, I live by faith. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ and the scriptures hold the answer. So it's, it's one thing to say it's a promised presence. And you say, okay, well, it's, Jesus promised it, but how do we know that it's true? If you go back to our text, go back to our text in Matthew chapter 28. I had never noticed this before. And I think because I just key in on the Great Commission charge. But you, if you might have picked up on it when we read the text in Matthew 28, the 11 disciples in verse 16 to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Have you ever noticed that before? So if, if, so Matthew was present, and Matthew is recording this. I don't know, if, if I were to give details of my family history, I, I wouldn't want to detail instances of doubt or things that would be embarrassing. What is it here that why would the apostles, why would some be doubting? And I don't think they're doubting that Jesus is the Son of God. They've witnessed his miracles. They've just experienced his earth-shattering resurrection. They're not doubting who he is, but I think they're doubting that he's about ready to leave them. Like, wait a minute. Everything we've been working for They were excited about the kingdom coming, and now you're leaving us? And they're doubting. And so I I put up four reasons why I think that they were doubting. One is, and I think if we look at these, it will help us understand why we may doubt the presence of Jesus in our lives. Because of the same four reasons. One is, they had unfulfilled expectations. In Acts chapter 1, remember when they saw Jesus, they said, Is now the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They had a different expectation of what the kingdom was going to be like. And so that wasn't happening. And so they're doubting. Wait a minute. This plan is not the way that we planned it in our mind. They also were perhaps feeling abandoned. Try to imagine this overwhelming feeling of someone you love coming back from the dead. You know, my my father passed away this last year and my mom and my brother and I, you know, we've all had dreams that we've talked to our dad, to, to, to my dad. And you just think, what, what would that be like to have a loved one come back to life? You wouldn't want to let him go. And so Jesus actually comes back to life. And then now, wait a minute, you're going to leave us? They could be feeling abandoned. What are we going to do without you? They could be feeling inadequate. So this mission of establishing the kingdom and spreading the gospel to all nations, you're wanting us to do that without you? How are we, fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, how are we Galileans supposed to carry out this gospel to the ends of the earth? Feeling inadequate, feeling abandoned, unfulfilled expectations, and formidable opposition finally would create doubt. Some 50 days prior, Jesus, remember, was brutally tortured slaughtered and you're wanting us to go into that same town and preach the gospel what's going to happen to us so even if the apostles had problems with doubt uh, then we need to understand well so so it's it's common that we too would struggle with doubt so do you doubt the presence of jesus i think of that those those words and some doubted you know we worship every first day of the week And we are encouraged by being with our brethren, and we come around the throne of God, but then we go home, and some doubt. We return to heavy burdens. Or we believe that God rules in the kingdoms of men, but then we turn on the news, or we scroll through our phone feed, and we see what's happening in the world, and it looks like Satan is winning, and some doubt. We see what's happening in Russia, the Ukraine, Afghanistan, and even in Washington, and some doubt. We read another story of riots and protests and school shootings and some doubt. So much evil. Or we get excited about evangelism and we face rejection and apathy and then we we doubt the ability to carry out the Great Commission. We believe in life after death, 
But then another loved one dies, and we find ourselves at the, at the cemetery burying another loved one, and we doubt. Unfulfilled expectations, feeling abandoned, feeling inadequate, and formidable opposition can create doubt. Well, what I want to affirm to you is that the presence of Jesus removes all of these doubts. And so let's look at the second point, and that is that Jesus is present because it is a proven presence. And many of these points have already been made during this lectureship. Jesus was present on the earth, and there's eyewitnesses. Not only do we have the writings of his followers and his disciples that were described just moments ago, but also of secular historians that describe that Jesus was present on the earth. So we won't spend time talking about that. Jesus was present prior to his incarnation. As we look at what, look at, if, if you were to write the story of Jesus and you have the four gospels, where would you begin to tell the story of Jesus? Mark starts with John the Baptist and goes back to Isaiah in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Where does Matthew start when he says, okay, let me tell you the story of Jesus. I'm going to go all the way back to Abraham in Matthew chapter 1. Luke, where does Luke start as he wants to tell the story of Jesus? He goes all the way back to Adam in Luke chapter 3 in verse 38. And then John, where does he start? He goes all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning was the word. He goes even back farther prior to creation. Jesus is present now because he's always been present. And Jesus was present before creation. I love what Sean said just moments ago about how the, the I have come statements emphasize that Jesus was preexistent before he arrived on the earth, before he became flesh. John 1, 1 through 3, Jesus was in the beginning with God. John 17, 5, Jesus was glorified with the Father before the world was. John 17, 24, the Father loved Jesus before the foundation of the world. And so what does that tell us? That Jesus' presence is not limited to a, a physical bodily manifestation because he was present and existent prior to his time in the flesh. And Jesus' presence is not limited to time and to creation. Jesus was present during the creation. Colossians 1 and verse 16. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or power or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Jesus was present during creation. And so if he is the creator, then he is not limited to the laws of creation, the laws of nature, the laws of science. And so when we try to think of our, our idea of how is Jesus present and we try to put him in physical laws, we don't need to look at it that way because Jesus' manifestation is not limited to those things. Jesus is also present during Old Testament history. It's when you read through the New Testament and then you come across amazing passages like Hebrews chapter 11, verses 25 to 26. And when we think about Jesus and his role often simply just being in the New Testament, we find these passages that tell us that Jesus was present before creation, he was present at creation, and he was present all the way through the history of mankind, even in the Old Testament, that Moses, living by faith, esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. How does all that work? I don't know, but there was a work of Christ, and Moses was involved in that, and that, that was... Christ was present in that story of Egypt. Also, Jude 4 through 5 speaks of this. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, speaking of their time in the wilderness, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Jesus, though it's hard for us to understand, he was present with our Old Testament patriarchs. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10 through 11 Jesus was present in the spirit of the Old Testament prophets. And we read about the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Jesus was present in all of these cases. And then perhaps we can relate most of all to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. 
who Jesus has risen from the grave and he's walking with them and they don't even see him. And maybe that's how I've been in my walk as a Christian for a long time is I've thought that Jesus isn't with me. But as we read in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, Jesus was with them and he revealed himself to them. And then he says, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And so Jesus is saying all of scripture is speaking of me. Jesus' presence was not limited to his death. And then even more powerfully, his presence was not limited to uh, prior to his ascension. When you go into the New Testament, we see example after example of the interaction of Jesus in humanity. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, so this would be a parallel to the Great Commission passage. In Mark 16 and verse 20, Listen to what this passage says. Jesus has ascended already. His bodily presence is gone. But in Mark 16, 20, it says, They went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. How did he do that? The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. The Lord was present. So there he's fulfilling his promise that he told them, I'm going to send you out and I'm not going to abandon you. My divine presence will be with you. And he was with them as they spread the gospel. In Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, as Luke continues his account that he began in the gospel of Luke, he says that his account is of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And so that's implying for us that his account in Luke was just a beginning of the work of Jesus, that his work is not limited to the work that he accomplished in his bodily manifestation in the Gospels, but that he was still working through the book of Acts. And there are over ten references in the book of Acts and in the epistles where we see Jesus present at Stephen's uh, execution in Acts chapter 7, in Paul's uh, vision on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Over and over again, Paul says that he saw the Lord, that the Lord stood by Paul, And then most telling of all, I believe, is in Revelation chapter 2 and in verse 1, where we see Jesus writing to the churches, the seven churches of Asia, and we see he's described as walking in the midst of the churches. Jesus is walking in our midst. He is fulfilling that promise. He has promised it, and he has proven it. So let's get to the, the application as we look at our third point, and see that Jesus has promised that he would be with us. He's proven that he would be with us, that his presence is not limited to his bodily manifestation, but that it was prior and even before creation, all throughout Old Testament history, and then even after he ascended and it went on through the New Testament. What's the point? This week you have heard exceptional lessons proclaiming various aspects about Jesus, that he lived He performed miracles, that he was born of a virgin, that he rose again. But what's the point of it all if he's not present? There's a difference in saying Jesus rose and Jesus is risen. Do you, though it's spectacular, was the proof of the resurrection only significant in just the event itself? Or is it significant because of what it enables Christ to do through eternity? Jesus is risen so that he can reign on his throne, so that he can spread his gospel, so that he can empower his believers, so that he can be present with us. And we're going to go through some examples of how he does that. And so I I think it's important for us to have not a past tense mentality about the resurrection, but to look at it as it's ongoing in the sense that Jesus is risen, that he is risen to reign, he's risen to rule, he's risen to be present with believers. Yeah. If you, what would be the point if, if uh, you had a loved one that came back to life, but then you couldn't, he, he wasn't active and he wasn't present and he wasn't with you anymore? 
what's the point of him being risen? Right? You would want your loved one to be risen so that you could have relationship with him. Jesus is risen. And so he is risen to empower us. So if we go back to our text in Matthew chapter 28, this is fan- phenomenal. As I, as I look at this, pretend that there's just 11 of us here. And you have been given the task to take the gospel to the world. And this is your task. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Could you, could you imagine having good? It's challenging enough for us when we leave here to go to our hometowns to face the opposition we face, to deal with apathy, to deal with discouragement, to face struggles. But imagine if there, were, there weren't any other churches, it was just 11 of us, and Jesus is saying to you, I want you to spread the church around the world. And so he's saying, make disciples of, what? of all the nations. And what does that include? It's this formidable task of reaching, transforming, and uniting self-righteous Jews, idolatrous Gentiles, immoral pagans, And the very ones who murdered the Son of God. Do you think you could do that? Can you make all of them united into one family? Can you make disciples of all nations? And then to go? He's telling the apostles to go, which would involve intentional action, costly sacrifice, painful goodbyes, and unknown tomorrows. Are you ready to go? And then to baptize? To to take these idolatrous, pagan, immoral, self-righteous murderers and then convince them that they're to humbly submit to a water ritual of baptism as a demonstration of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? How are we going to convince people to do that? And then to teach them not just a, a simple salvation message, but to teach them all that I've commanded you. This is an overwhelming task. But notice that Jesus has not abandoned his apostles and he's not abandoned us. Because in this, this charge, this charge to make disciples by going and by baptizing and by teaching is surrounded by two bedrock promises or two bedrock principles about who Jesus is. The omnipotence of Jesus and the omnipresence of Jesus. He says, I have all authority. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So there is no realm, no cave, no place on this earth where Jesus' authority is not present. There is no realm in the heavens, in the spiritual places where Christ is not supreme. His omnipotence. He's saying, I'm going to send you out, and I'm sending you out with my authority and my power. And not only that, but then he says, I'm going to be with you. His omnipotence and his omnipresence. Now, each one of those things are tremendous, but without the other, it would be insignificant. What if Jesus was all-powerful, but then he wasn't with us? What good would that do for us? And what if Jesus was with us, but he wasn't all-powerful? How would we accomplish this task? The point of this text is, as Jesus is saying, I am not abandoning you, but I'm giving you the power that you need And I'm giving you my presence to help you carry out this mission. And that will remove the doubt. And we need to hear that. You say, well, where, how did he do that? Well, Jesus went with them. We already read in Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, the parallel passage of this commission, that he did the exact same thing that he just promised. They went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word to the accompanying signs. So Jesus did what he said he was going to do. And so everything that he's telling them to do in this great commission, he was with them on. When they went, he was there. Was he not with Paul and Stephen? Was he not with the apostles? When they made disciples, he was there. When someone becomes a disciple through the sanctification process, Jesus is there. When they were baptized, he was there. As souls are baptized into the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection, when they taught others... His commands, he is Logos, he is the word, he was there. 
Jesus did not enlist the apostles and then abandon them without power and without his presence. And Jesus does not enlist us to be his disciples and abandon us. To say that, well, we can't teach the gospel. We see that Jesus exists, but what are we going to do at this lectureship if we don't go out and tell other people about it? And you say, well, I can't do it. We don't have the power. We have the power, and we have his presence, and we have his truth. So, Jesus, how does he empower us? He empowers our walk. We read that we're to walk in the straight and narrow way. Jesus doesn't call us to follow after him and then say, good luck. You're on your own. Find your way to heaven. No, he, he came to the earth to walk the steps for us and that we walk in his footsteps. First Peter chapter two and verse 21. And so we have his example about how he interacted with his family, with how he interacted with sinners, how he interacted with the religious leaders, how he interacted with the enemies, how, how he interacted with Satan. All these are examples that he empowers us in our walk. So when we walk in his way, Jesus is present. Jesus not only equips our walk, he equips our prayers. Jesus doesn't say, okay, I want you to pray to the Father, but good luck getting your message to the Father and getting the Father to hear you. No, that's not what he does. He helps us with our prayers. We pray through his name, John 14, 13. So when we pray, he is present. He is our mediator and our intercessor, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 16. It's through his work as a high priest that we can boldly approach the throne of grace, Hebrews chapter 4, 15 through 16. You say, where is Jesus? When we walk, he's present. And when we pray, he's present. Jesus equips our repentance. He doesn't say, okay, stop sinning, but good luck, you're on your own. No, in 1 John 1, 7 through 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. Jesus is our advocate. When we repent, he helps us. Jesus is present. When we teach, Jesus is present. What are we teaching? Where do we get the message from? Jesus is the author. He is the message. He is the source. He is the motive. He's the glory. He's the authority of all that we teach. How can you say Jesus is not present? Jesus is, the, is present in our teaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, Paul said, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Is Jesus central in your message? When we teach, Jesus is present. When we worship, Jesus doesn't say, try to... I think we were studying just uh, in our Wednesday night class about how the Jews, the Hebrews were terrified to come to Mount Sinai and the thunder and the lightning. And God said to step back. Jesus now invites us to worship in the heavenly tabernacle in the presence of God. And he doesn't say, well, try to figure out how to come on your own and your own righteousness. No, he is our high priest giving us confident access. Hebrews 4 15 through 16. When we pray in our worship on Sundays, we pray, when we observe the Lord's Supper, when we give for his work, when we teach his word, Jesus is present. Jesus is present in our suffering. I know you've talked about this a lot this week already, and you are no stranger here to suffering. But Jesus doesn't say, take up your cross and follow me, and when times get tough, you're on your own. No, he says, pick up my yoke. I will help you. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. The compassion of Jesus standing at the right hand of his father's throne when Stephen was being slaughtered, stones being hurled upon him one after the other. Does Jesus, is he present when we suffer? Do you see that picture? And then when Jesus approached Saul and came against him with charges of like, why are you persecuting me in Acts chapter 9 and verses 4 through 5? How are they persecuting Jesus? How is Paul persecuting Jesus? 
Jesus felt every blow, every insult. He was being persecuted when his church was being persecuted. When we suffer, Jesus is present. Jesus is present when we die. You are no stranger to the faces of death. David said in Psalm 23 and verse 4, You are with me, I fear no evil, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Paul found comfort in Philippians 1, how he said that I, I desired to depart and to be with Christ. When we face death, Jesus is present. And then finally, Jesus is present when we face our judgment. Jesus doesn't say, confess me before men, but when you get to the judgment, you're on your own. No, he says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. I will be your advocate. Jesus does not send us to the judgment unrepresented. So as we conclude, I want to make three closing points. Are you still not convinced? Where is Jesus' presence? You know, I possess an antique wooden sewing cabinet. And to most, it would be nothing of great value. It would not sell for much. But to me, it's priceless. The beauty that I see in the cabinet is rooted in the beauty of the cabinet maker. My grandfather made that cabinet. And so I, I have this, I cherish it because it represents to me his presence. And I'm sure you have handiwork, heirlooms that reflect the presence of your loved ones. Do you not see God? As the creator of all things, we see Christ in his creation. That's what Psalm 19 tells us. The heavens declare the glory of God. Last summer, we went on a trip with our family, went camping down at the Grand Canyon. We set our alarm, got up before dark so we could see the sunrise. And then we go and are huddled in there. There must have been 100 people. And I don't know the faith of those that were huddled there, but you think, what, what are all these people doing getting up before dark to watch something that Christ has made? Jesus is saying, I'm right here. Don't you see me? So if you can't see Christ's presence, then you need to spend more time looking at his creation. Jesus paints his brilliant presence on the starry canvas of the universe. He carves his rugged resilience on the rocky mountaintops. He radiates his glorious creativity across the earthly landscape. And he shows his inexhaustible power sustaining all living things. If the presence of Jesus is absent in your life, stop. Open your eyes to his creation. Another way we see Jesus is in his words. I have a note that my daughter Jessica wrote that she gave me that I keep in my Bible um, just a few days after her car accident. And to other people, it's, it's not important. Its value is not in paper and ink, but its value lies in the words, precious words of a loved one. I keep it in my Bible as a reminder of my daughter's presence. I'm sure you have cards, letters from loved ones. Why do you keep them? Because they remind you of your loved one's presence. Jesus is present in his words. When I reread my daughter's letter, I hear her voice. If the presence of Jesus is absent in your life, spend more time in his word, and there you will hear his voice. And then finally, Jesus' presence we can see in his church. In the days that followed my daughter's accident, uh, we saw Christ's presence manifested in you, the family of God. When our family was falling, you caught us. The church, though we are not perfect, we need to stop attacking one another and we need to start seeing the love of Christ in the church. In Christians, we see Christ. In the kingdom, we see the king. In the sheep, we see the shepherd. In the branches, we see the vine. In the bride, we see the groom. In the body, we see the head. We need to see Christ in his church. And if the presence of Jesus is absent in your life, perhaps it's because you're detached from your brethren. 
And you need to see his family and to see him in his family. So I didn't tell you what happened after the the car accident. Praise the Lord that Matt and Jessica are alive and well. Matt, uh, unbelievably, thankfully to the Lord, uh, had no broken bones. His head was scalped. He went through three surgeries. And it was very traumatic with skin grafts on his his head. And he, he says today... That I'm thankful for these scars because it gives me an opportunity to tell other people about how God saved me. What a great testimony. And my daughter broke her ankle and had some other injuries, but she is doing well. And two days ago, uh, she knocked on my door. I was sick in bed, and she came to tell me goodbye. She and five of her girlfriends loaded up the van with camping gear, and they are headed out west. And so I hugged her. And part of me wanted to say, no, (laughs) no more road trips. You can't go. But I still heard that little three-year-old voice saying, push me high up into the sky, Dad. We have nothing to fear if we are safe in the arms of Jesus. And may we all live with that passion to serve God, to carry his gospel to the world. Our last question is not, does Jesus want to be with you? It shouldn't be, is Jesus present with his believers? We already know that. The question is, do you want to be present with him? That's the question. Are you seeking him? Because he's right there. He stands at the door and knocks. Will you open?